chapter 2, and now we're finishing chapter 3. Paul makes the case, as we recap this, he makes the case for all humanity, that all humanity has sinned, and all humanity has fallen short, and continuously falls short of the glory of God, and that there is not one that's righteous, not one. Which means that we cannot ever go to God and say, God, give me 99% of your righteousness and accept 1% of mine. Okay? And Paul's going to make the case here for that, and that's that there is no room for boasting. There is no way that we can ever go to God and say, see what I did? All we can do is say, wow, Father, look at what you've done through your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you. I praise you. And I accept this awesome gift of salvation. It's a gift. Does it come with strings or is it free? Free. Are you sure it's free? Yes. You're positive that it's free. If it wasn't free, it wouldn't be a gift, would it? Right? You've had, you've had those kind of gifts, right? Here, here's a gift. But if you want it, this is what you have to do. Okay. God's gift is given to all humanity. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Jesus Christ, God has reconciled the world unto Himself. So there is, as the world sees it, they think that God is upset with them. A lot of churches teach that you must do this and you must do that before you come to God. But God has said is, I have done everything. Come to me. Don't worry about where your life is right now, because if you come to me, I will change that. And that's the greatest thing about God. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's look into this. Paul says, where is boasting then? It is excluded. It says, by what law? Of works? No, it's excluded by the law of of faith. And as I said, faith, faith.
Faith tells you that there is nothing that you bring to God that He wants or needs from you except for empty hands and an open heart. God provides everything you need for your salvation. God has reconciled you. God has made you righteous because He gives you His righteousness. Is there any higher righteousness than God's? Think about this. Is there any higher righteousness than God's? Why would we want to add something from ourselves on top of what God has given us? This is why it is a free gift. And our response, again, is, thank you. I accept. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified how? Say it loud because you're not talking. It's okay. So a person is justified by faith apart from the what? The deeds of the law. As we've been finding out, as we heard this morning from our Sabbath school teacher. What's the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to show you what sin is, okay? Because sin is a deviation of the law, right? The law. The law also will show you the character of God. God never lies. God never steals. God never murders. And God will never allow somebody to take his place. He will never share his power with somebody else, or else he wouldn't be God. Okay? So you go through all ten, and you see the attributes and the love of God. But what does the law do for me? Yeah. And this is where the personal testimony is going to come in a little later. Again, the Sabbath school went over this, and it was very clear, very plain. All the law does for me is condemn me and show me that I am a sinner. I want to please God. I want to give Him all of my heart. All of my mind, all of my strength. And what I find is that in this flesh, it doesn't happen. I don't want to lie. What do I find? In this flesh, go through all ten. I want to be faithful. The law keeps showing me this is the standard, but it doesn't ever say, how do I reach it? Nor does it give me any help in reaching it. It's like a book that they give you in school, and they tell you, this is what you need to study, there's going to be a test afterwards, and the rest of your life is going to be determined by how well you pass this test. And you open up that book, and it's one page, and it's blank. And you're like, what? All the law does is just continuously condemn me and put me in bondage. Bondage. I know what bondage is. And I don't like it. I want to be free. And how do I find freedom? Freedom only comes in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And all this has to be based on a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not know Him, none of this will ever work. The title of this message is, Victory in Jesus is impossible. Amen. Think of your life in the past. Has Christ given you victory? If He's given you victory in the past, will He give you victory in the future? Amen. But what's the key to that victory? Say it loud. Allowing Him to lead. Right. Isn't it just submitting <coughs> to His Lordship? But what's the hardest thing for us to actually do? Let our, yeah, our glory in the dust and to submit, to submit to anybody, even our Father. Because my human nature says, well, I'll submit, I'll submit this, but um, I'm going to keep this. And maybe one day we'll get to this. And then that day comes and I say, okay, well, I'll submit that, but I'm going to continue to keep this. God says, listen, I want it all. Okay? So let me read a couple things to you this morning. It 
This is about the term boasting. Since righteousness is a free gift of God through Jesus Christ, it is evident that no one can justly boast of any righteousness that he has. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 say, For by the grace, or for by grace, are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What boasting proves? Turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Habakkuk is in the Old Testament. You know this. You know this text. Because Paul quotes it. Okay? But I want you, we, we know the last part of this text. I want you to see the first part of this text. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. You guys there? Say amen. amen. Okay, the first part. I want you to see this first part. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. The person that is lifted up and proud, his soul is not upright in him. If, and this is talking about religious people, okay? It's talking about the God. God does not need any of your righteousness because your righteousness to him is as what? Filthy rags. What God needs is your heart and a submissive spirit. So if you are puffed up, because of your so-called righteousness, because of your victory over sin, then that just proves that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Okay? So let me continue to read this. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall what? Live by his faith. Habakkuk 2 4. <laughs> Boasting, therefore, is an evidence of a sinful heart. Can God and pride live in the same place? Right? No. But suppose a man boasts of his righteousness, as for instance, when a man says that he has lived without sin for so many years. Well, turn with me to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. Again, we went over this in our Sabbath school class. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Rick, do you have that? 1 John chapter 1. Yep. Verse 8. Can you read that for me, please? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Mm. But are not the grace and power of God manifested in Christ to cleanse and keep us from sin? The answer to that is, most certainly, but only when in humility, and that's the key word, and that's where the focus is. Only when in humility we acknowledge that we are sinners. Why couldn't Jesus help the scribes and Pharisees of his day? They didn't see their need for him. They wanted a Messiah, right? But was he the Messiah they wanted? And when he didn't meet their expectations, what did they want to do with him? Get him out of here, get us another one. Who did they turn to? They rejected their Savior and said, give us Caesar. Shows you where their hearts were at. Okay, what did they want? Their focus, their attention, were on worldly things. They wanted a worldly, temporal kingdom. And Jesus came to establish an eternal, spiritual kingdom. But only when in humility we acknowledge that we are sinners, if we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1 9. When we say that we have no sin, that very thing is evidence that we have. But when with faith in the word of the Lord we say that we are sinners, then the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. In the plan of salvation, there is no place for human pride and human boasting. The angels that did not fall, that kept their estate in heaven, are they prideful? Is their attention on their glory? You read the book of Revelation. When you are drawn to the very presence of God at His throne, what are the angels doing? They are praising Him day in. Day out. 
And we're told that we'll be doing the same thing, that we'll cast our crowns at his feet. Amen. Singing glory, glory to God and to the Lamb. And that throughout eternity, that will never grow old. I get old with something after a day or two. Sometimes it's only an hour. Mm -hmm. saying, have you ever really thought about eternity? Something that never, ever ends. I love children. You know why? Because children, when they start to grasp how long eternity is, they ask you, what happens if I get bored? <laughs> and it's like, I ask that question all the time before I start to understand who Jesus Christ really is. Think about what it means that, how many of you guys are slaves to the clock? Am I the only one really seriously? Okay. Okay, there's, okay, thank you. Leave me hanging by myself. Okay, I'm a slave to the clock. My day starts early in the morning, and it goes till it gets dark, and then I go home and still have stuff I have to do, and then get ready to go to bed and do it all over again. And it's that way six days a week. And you know where I'm at on the seventh day? Sure. And I, and I still have to look at the clock. Because I, I need to make sure I'm here. Have I ever been late in 11 years? <laughs> Used to drive your father nuts. I am who I am. This is what it is. God is merciful. God is graceful. So anyway. Let's look at verse in chapter 3 of Romans. I'm going to read 27, 28, and then I'm going to read 29 again. So where is boasting then? Is it excluded? By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? No, he is not. Or is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? That's a very, very key and important question, especially in our day today. What do we do with the law? Okay? Do we say that, well, it's done away with, we're no longer under it? That is true, we're no longer under it, but do you understand what it means to actually be under it? And what it meant, and what you have in your freedom in Christ? Does it mean that the law is done away with, and so now I never have to worry about if I steal, or if I lie, or if I put something in front of God in my life? Right? As a Christian, should you not have God number one in your life? That you bow down to no one or nothing else but Him? Go through all ten. Are they still valid as... How did she put it, Chuck? Did you put it out this morning? The law is... Not established. Mirror. That what is the purpose of the law? It's to show us as Christians how we are to live. Right. Is that correct? Standard. It's a standard. The law is not a means of salvation, but the law is still a standard of living, right? Isn't that what's wrong with our world? That the world today has no law, especially none of God's laws. And so what we see is just the reaping of what we as a culture have sown for decades, right? And when you don't teach children about the truth of God, that He has a way for you to live, a way for you to think, a way for you to interact with each other, and that way is based on love, but there are rules and guidelines. When we don't follow those, does it affect how society will prosper? Or fall. So what is the purpose of the law? The law is here to show me that I can never keep it. I can't live up to that standard in this flesh. But what God has said is, listen, come to me. I give you my son. I give you my righteousness. And I will put in your heart the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is in your heart, 
Now the law will be there as well. And so you're not bound by the letter, but you can live by the Spirit. Galatians 2.20, what does it say? I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, turn it. Turn it, Galatians 2.20. Patty, can you pull that up on your phone? <laughs> I want you to read it if you can. Galatians 2.20. Jesus lived while he was here on this earth? Did he not live a life of what true love really is? Did he not show the, and fulfill the true character and nature of what God really is? Did the world have a perverted view of God? Did not his own people have a perverted view of who God the Father was? Did not Jesus come and live out a life of love. And how did he do it? He showed you that the fulfillment of the law through him is love. How does that happen? Listen. If I care for you, I'm going to make sure that I'm honest with you. I'm going to make sure that if you have a need, and if I can meet that need, I'm going to meet that need. I'm going to make sure that what God has shared with me, I in turn will share with you. Is that not the fulfillment of the law? The only way that can happen is if Christ lives in your heart. That is a, as I said earlier, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is trying to establish here in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Chapters 1, 2, part of 3, we are sinners and we're in a bad place. We have no help and no hope, no, no help. We have no hope of ever saving ourselves. So we cannot look to the inside of us. Well, if I just am a little bit stronger, if my willpower is a little bit stronger, I can do this. It doesn't happen. What we have to do is look to the outside for something to come in. And what that is, is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Okay, so, as we wind down this chapter, the last thing he talks about is establishing the law through faith. Let me read this. The law of works is simply the Ten Commandments in form only. Okay? Compliance with the law of works enables one to appear outwardly righteous, but within he is full of corruption. Those were the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day. He says, you guys are like graves, You're like dead men's bones. Yet the one who follows the law of works is not always necessarily a hypocrite. Think about this. He may have an earnest desire to keep the commandments, but may be deceived into thinking that he can work them out himself. The law of faith. This has for its object the same thing as the law of works, namely obedience to God. What is obedience to God? Think about it. Faith. What does God command? Doesn't God command? Text. Hear this. This is what your God commands. To live justly. Love mercy. And what's the last part? Walk humbly with your God. Outside of Christ, I'm not a humble person. Outside of Christ, I don't know what justly is. I know human justice, but when you start to understand God and the depths of His character and His holiness and His purity, you realize where He is and where I am. You start to realize I need Christ. I need Christ. Because outside of Christ, there is no help for me. 
And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. There's no help for you either. You guys understand that? Outside of Christ, we are a doomed, hopeless race. This is why the Bible says that there is one name given to man under heaven whereby you can be saved. And that name is? Jesus Christ. Christ. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Why? Because that's the only way it can happen. Who else paid the penalty for your sin? Who else did God use as the propitiation for your sin? Who else will live inside of you, make His abode in your heart, and change you from the inside out? Amen? Amen. So, this has for its object the same thing as the law of works, namely, obedience to the commandments of God. But the result is different. The law of works deceives a man with a form. Understand this. The law of works deceives a man with a form. The law of faith gives him the substance. You guys understand that? The law of faith gives him the substance. The law of faith is the law as it is in Jesus. The one may be a sincere attempt to keep the law, the other is the actual accomplishment of that desire through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Ten Commandments as given by the Lord are only a law of faith since God never designed that they should be taken in any other way. And He never expected that anybody could get righteousness from them in any other way than by faith. The law of works is man's perversion of the law of God and the gospel. So we close out chapter 3. And uh, I can't see that clock, so I don't know what time it is. The question is asked, can you actually have victory in Jesus? Look at your life. Look at what Christ has done for you. I'm going to give you my personal testimony. I have no memories at all until after the age of four. Everything before that, there's nothing there. My wife, what's the earliest memory you have, Toby? What age? <laughs> Two years old, okay? Like I said, it's after four. My father passed away when I was four. That's probably why I don't have memories prior to that. He was 28 years old. When he passed away, my family around me did not talk about him at all. And so I did not know anything about him except what I heard from others talking to him. My sister told me this morning that she would talk to my mother about him and my mother would talk to her. But she never talked to me about him at all. Um, never asked me if I had questions. We just, we, we just did not talk about it. And what I learned from an early age is that hurtful things, stressful things, you didn't talk about. You just kept that inside. If you showed weakness and you had older brothers, they usually made fun of you. So you didn't show that either. And what I learned growing up is that you just kept everything inside from a small child. And how much room is actually in a small child's body? How much stuff can he actually keep inside? Okay. So I remember that my father died. don't remember that, but my poor mother went through a lot. And usually after his death, I was the focal point of any emergency that happened. Remember I said yes, right? right? So he dies at four, and right that same year, I got to play with the big kids across the street. They used to play this game where they rode their bicycles, and it's kind of like a game of baseball. I had a tricep, I was riding that. And I was so excited, I wasn't looking where I was going, and I hit a fence, and I flew over my handlebars, and I hit the top of a, a, a you know how a fence comes up on top? I split my chin up, okay? Four years old, they take me to the hospital, and they sewed, gave me stitches without any type of painkiller. First memory I have. 
<laughs> is looking up and seeing people with masks on and hearing a doctor cursing it because I was not sitting still. Okay? Have you ever had stitches without any milk? Okay? Four years old. I realized right then.